So we are in session 12 and uh, we will continue with the dot and modifiers. In this session we will be looking into an event, delegates, extern, override, read-only, sealed, static, unsafe, virtual, and volatile. Okay, so we will look into all these modifiers available in csharp.net and wherever possible we will compare uh, equivalent uh, keywords inside VB.net as well. Okay, so let's kick off session 12. So to give you an overview of a delegate, what is a delegate? So delegate uh, in C sharp is similar to a function pointers in C or C++. If you remember, we did talk about the pointers in the earlier discussions uh, and uh, using an unsafe code, we can actually have uh, implement the pointers, although uh, .NET doesn't support the pointers concept because the CLR, uh, CLR is not going to support the pointers concept. Uh, so the workaround we have here is a delegate. So delegates are pretty similar, but not exactly same. Okay, so the the uh, the concept of delegate uh, uh, makes possible for referring a method's address at runtime. So you pass a reference in the uh, reference of an address and uh, invoke the respective method collectively, uh, whichever you referred at runtime. Uh, and pointers are pretty uh, uh, specific to the same thing. It pointers are refer, refer the address rather than the value of the variable. It's pretty much like a reference type, but uh, uh, but they are not they are not object oriented. So pointers are not object oriented or type safe or secure, and that's why um, we um, refer that to as unsafe code. Whereas delegates are completely object oriented and they are type safe and also secure. Uh, in, uh, so the, what that means is if I declare a delegate uh, inside a class that can be um, used by the uh, derived members within this and also the other members also make use of it. So that's kind of a uh, object oriented uh, so, so if you declare any delegates that can be reused across the programs. Okay, so the um, so there are three steps to create a a, a delegate. Uh, number one is uh, declare a delegate. So how you declare a delegate? You use the de a delegate keyword uh, along with the access modifier. So the access modifier public here and the delegate and the return type. So of, uh, after following uh, the delegate, it's pretty much a, a method signature which has a return type, a name for, of the method, and uh, of course a set of parameters to it. And uh, again, so when you have a de declare a delegate, uh, it will not have a body. So it's uh, pretty much like an abstract, uh, but a delegate has a special meaning um, than the abstract. Okay, so abstract members need to be implemented, but delegates are, uh, once, once you have a delegate, it uh, has a signature that is mapped. So whichever methods uh, have the same signature can be handled you with this delegate. Okay, so the delegate name here is the star delegate. I just gave a name, uh, and the point number two, the step two would be bind the methods to the delegate. So if you have n number of methods, so in this case, if you remember, the methods can be of any form. So a method, all it cares is a method. Whether is method is coming from a, as a static method of a one class or a or an instance method of a of an instance of another object, or it's just a static method somewhere hanging around, uh, it doesn't matter. So the method can be from any corner or hook and corner of your code, and it doesn't matter uh, even with the access modifier of that method also because uh, immaterial, uh, immaterial to what access modifier they have, where they are residing, all it cares is the reference to that method. So when I bind a method to a delegate, so it's uh, pretty much creating instance of the start delegate. So creating instance of the start delegate, as a start delegate instance, 
and uh, I'm passing the method uh, as a parameter to it. So remember, so although uh, OBJ Nissan is a uh, some class, uh, some class which has a start method. So this is a pretty much an uh, instance method that I passed as a reference. We'll see again how we can do with these static methods also. Static methods, as you remember, if you recap, static members are associated to the class but not to the instance. They are specific to a class but not to the instance. What that means is the static members will be will have only one copy for any number of instances that class has. Okay, we will see that also today. So, in this case, I'm adding the start method, which is an instance method, which is part of the Nissan or a car class. And the third step will be invoking the delegate. Okay, so if you look at the steps that we have followed, all we did is to invoke the obj nissan.start method so which i can do straightforward by creating object obj nissan and just call the start method so doing all this doesn't make sense really um, so the it makes sense in wired um, situations wherein uh, if you want to invoke as i mentioned the uh, the heterogeneous methods which has the same signature which can be of different classes and you can associate a delegate with multiple methods at the same time. So you can assign 10 different methods to the same delegate and when you say the delegate instance dot invoke, so all those 10 different methods can be invoked with the same uh, with one line of code here. So this will add more uh, benefits uh, when we do um, uh, kind of an advanced programming. Um, so I'll try to demo that with a, a very good example uh, today. So this is a code um, that I have to demonstrate the, the delegates. So um, if you see the first part is the delegate declaration. I just added the comment also. Uh, once you download the source code, you will see the same comments uh, as a step approach. Uh, whereas I have a first step zero, 01, uh, the second step here 2 and third step 3. Okay, the first step is the declaration of a delegate and if you carefully see this, the declaration of delegate is not within a, um, within an another method or within an, uh, uh, another class. It's completely outside uh, the class declaration. So all of this code is not, uh, this uh, snapshot is not clear. I will open this delegate here. Okay. okay, let me uncomment this. The same practice we do, uncomment the commented ones. Okay, so yeah, if you see it carefully here, um, this delegate declaration is completely um, under the namespace root, okay, not under any class. Okay, so that's a big difference. Uh, if you see the abstract members, they normally are part of another class or, or another uh, an interface. Uh, so the delegates are completely different. They are they sit outside the class. You can of course uh, declare the delegate within a class also. Um, in this context, I have it uh, declared outside. Okay, so um, so the delegate uh, in this case uh, uh, delegates. One important thing to remember is the signature of the method should match the uh, the methods that you're associating with it. So if the signature doesn't match, then you cannot associate that method with this delegate. Okay, so that's a very, very key important point to remember with when you play with delegates. Okay, so we'll go back to the slide. And here, in this case, I have a static method. Okay, which is again um, hanging. A static method can be part of, uh, need to be part of another class anyway. Um, in this case, I uh, have a static method. Again, if you carefully observe, the signature of this method matches the delegate signature. Whereas uh, we have the void as a written type. This also has a void as a written type and it has a name, it can be any name of course and of course uh, the name of it, um, the delegate here and it takes one parameter of type string. Okay, of course name of the 
parameter doesn't matter the type of the matter uh, type of the parameter matters okay uh, this is same like our overloading principle wherein the type matters not the name of the parameter okay so it should match the uh, delegates signature and that's one method we have another method is within the uh, main in this case uh, since we already have the car class demonstrated in, in the previous sessions uh, so I'm making use of the car class here so I just created an instance of car as obj Nissan and uh, three instances uh, one is a Nissan uh, the other one is obj Toyota the third one is obj Honda so all of these three uh, got instantiated with the respective values and uh, the step two, I'm actually binding the methods to the delegate. So the first method I'm um, binding here is using uh, the same uh, new construct, created instance of the delegate and pass the uh, Nissan.start as a, this is an instance, an instance method because this is part of the instance variable obj Nissan. Okay. And uh, similarly, uh, I have added uh, remaining three methods. So the first one I added as part of the new instance. In this case, this is uh, set to be a single cast delegate. Okay, so uh, a single cast delegate is a delegate that refers to only one method. Okay, so that's the key thing to remember. And when you associate more or more than one, that becomes a multicast delegate. By default, surprisingly, uh, a delegate is a multicast delegate. So if you see the, uh, the instance of this, and I just take a snapshot of the IntelliSense uh, at this stage, so it inherits from the multicast delegate. So this is a uh, base uh, system dot multicast delegate is a base class that your delegate is inheriting from. Okay. Um, so although you just specified this as a uh, delegate. Um, so the, the interesting thing here is that it is by default, although if you see it's a delegate, it's actually by default a multicast delegate. Okay. And here in this case, we have uh, three methods, three instance methods associated to the same delegate. If you say start delegate here. Okay, so we have one instance of the delegate and associated three start methods, one with the Nissan, uh, Nissan.start, Toyota.start, and Honda.start. Okay, and then immediately I also bind a static method. Okay, we just saw the static method. Uh, they also had the same signature. Uh, in this case, start also had the same signature, wherein it takes only one uh, parameter of type string. Okay, so if you see uh, one delegate can associate to any number of methods irrespective of their origin. So it can be a part of an instance uh, uh, member or it can be a static member or it can be a method or a, uh, within your class. So it doesn't matter. All it cares is uh, a method having the same signature. So, and since you pass the address of that method, it really doesn't matter. So where it is sitting, it's going to just go and ping them and execute them at runtime. So all we need to invoke is, uh, the third step here, is uh, call the dot invoke. And remember, if you see the parameter that I'm passing here is at this stage. So when I'm associating a method, you are just passing the method name, not the parameters. Okay, even in this case, uh, when, when it is a static method here, I'm just passing the static method name, uh, but not the uh, parameter. So if the static method signature, if you say, it takes a uh, parameter as an input. Okay, so in this case, uh, I didn't pass the parameter here. So I just pass the method name. And when I invoke it, uh, at that time, I'm going to pass the parameter. So what this means is, so the same parameter will be taken um, to all these methods and is going to execute when you say invoke. Okay, so the output uh, in this case, if you see, so the output in this case, we have uh, a car, for instance, in this case, a Nissan, 
Toyota, Honda, it got invoked the start method with the same parameter uh, and also invoked the static method here. So this is the static method uh, um, that we have within this program. So it says you invoke static method. Okay, so I hope this is pretty clear. Uh, we'll just quickly run this program uh, and walk through the same code here. So, so the delegate is outside it. It's got declared outside the uh, class uh, under the namespace. And uh, the program has a static method in this case, if you say. So this is a static method. And it just says you uh, you invoke static method, and I'm passing the whatever uh, input text I'm getting. I'm just showing it here. And um, the main method is actually creating three instances of the uh, car class. Each one of them uh, referring to a Nissan, Toyota, and Honda. And uh, yes, and I'm binding the and I'm binding the. So I'm going to make it a single line statement. Just um, okay. I just compile it. It's good. And uh, binding the instance method. So this is uh, since this start method is associated to the instance variable here. So it is referred to as an instance method. And so we have three instance methods added. And the key thing to uh, check here is the plus is equal to operator. Okay, so this is a key thing. So this is an increment operator uh, uh, using which you can actually even increment uh, arithmetic operations and using the same operator, we are actually adding multiple methods to the same uh, delegate. Okay, and uh, we also use a decrement oper operator when we want to remove methods from the delegate. So in this case, we are adding, if you want to remove a method from the delegate, you can use it, uh, you can use a decrement operator. I will show that also, okay? And uh, we added three methods there, and then, uh, and in this case, I'm binding the static method. Uh, for some reason, I just commented it out. Okay, so I'm binding, uh, sorry, associating, or binding, doesn't matter, it's same. Um, a static method. And remember, static methods are not associated to a instance in this case. So they are associated to the class. So in this case, I'm uh, referring to the static method directly from the class name. And uh, I just invoked this after, soon after invoking, all those four methods will be getting invoked with the parameter called start now. And followed by, I am, uh, okay, for now, well, let me take this away. Okay, we're going to run this. And if you see, uh, this is it. Uh, we have all these four methods got invoked, and uh, including the static method, and four different methods from each of those, those instances. Okay, and the increment, decrementing operator is what demonstrated down the line. So uh, after this invoke, at this stage, four methods get invoked. And at this stage, I'm actually removing one of them. Which one I'm removing? I'm actually removing the uh, Honda, a uh, Honda dot start. So if you remember, uh, we, are, we are passing the new instance of that uh, method using a plus is equal to operator. To remove it, we will use the same syntax but only the decrementing operator minus is equal to new start delegate and pass the Honda. So what will happen is within the delegate uh, queue, it's going to locate uh, this uh, particular uh, method reference and remove it. So in this case, uh, uh, we should see only the three methods uh, getting invoked uh, other than the Honda, right? Because we are a more Honda. So I'm going to run again. So if you see, um, in the first case, four methods got invoked. And um, the second case, only three methods. And uh, we don't see Honda in the list. OK? Uh, Honda got removed uh, using the decrement operator, minus is equal to. And Honda is not invoked in the second instance. Hope this is clear. 
Uh, this is pretty, pretty straightforward and uh, simple and this has a, a wide variety of usages. Um, we'll see one of the very, very hot usage of delegates in the next uh, immediate topic which is events. If you have any questions at this stage, uh, just uh, drop a line there. I will uh, respond to your questions at the end of this session, okay? Okay. Um, so we have just demonstrated this one and uh, we also saw the uh, removing the uh, methods from the delegate queue by using the decrement operator. Okay, just to recap, uh, to declare a delegate, you need to declare a delegate and then bind methods to the delegate, a material from where these methods are, uh, the method must follow the same signature to that of a delegate to bind it, otherwise it won't. So we'll, we'll see that negative operation also. Let's, let's uh, change the, uh, the signature of the static method. So assume that uh, this is taking two parameters, okay? Uh, it's taking int uh, say number, okay? It is taking two parameters and I'm going to compile this. So will this compile? No. So it's not going to compile. It is actually tripping with an error saying uh, what? So no overload for static method matches delegate. So the delegate start delegate is accepting only one parameter. So that indicates that uh, the, the method that you're associating to the delegate must match its signature. Okay, that's the very, very key thing to remember. Okay, so so once you uh, bind the methods, all you need is to invoke them. Okay, so this is going to be pretty much useful uh, in um, events. So the reason why I went back to delegates uh, is to show you event. So event is an access modifier, whereas a delegate is not an access modifier, it is a type. So delegate is a type, whereas uh, event is an access modifier, okay? So if you remember the difference between the access modifier and the type, that uh, when I mark uh, a, uh, a delegate, when I declare a delegate, I'm actually creating instance of that. So that pretty much uh, refers to a uh, standard notation of a type. Uh, whereas event, if you look at, so when I create an event, uh, it is completely different. Uh, so it's a modifier. It actually changes the behavior of a, a given member. So in this case, then uh, the event keyword uh, lets you specify a delegate that will be called upon the occurrence of some event. So if you remember, most of you are really uh, aware of the event-driven programming. So the event-driven programming are uh, pretty Windows-based application or web forms uh, wherein each of the user interaction is associated to an event. So like a button click or a mouse move or uh, any input devices uh, um, uh, like mouse hover or uh, click a button or select a checkbox. Uh, anything. So those kind of uh, uh, interactions with the UI elements are typically associated to an event. So a mouse click is one of the most common. Whenever you click a mouse, that's an event that is fired. Some of the events are pre-built uh, and you can actually create your own events in your classes. So the event-driven programming is a very popular model uh, uh, wherein the web forms use, where the events get handled at the server side when it is a web form. Uh, when it is a web page, uh, it doesn't matter. So uh, that's a typical difference between a web page and a web form. So you using an event keyword or a modifier, uh, we can actually create events of your own. Um, so in, in typical uh, applications like a Windows based applications or any other applications, if I, uh, if, for those who are not completely aware of uh, event, uh, what I'll do is, uh, it is pretty much associated uh, to the uh, uh, Windows based or web based applications. In this case, I'm just adding a new, new project of a type Windows uh, form, okay? So I have a form here and uh, 
and uh, let me have a toolbox open and uh, let me pick the common controls and out of this a button okay so this is a typical button control and when I double click on that it immediately gets me to a button click okay so if you see this is the event um, so this is the event handler that I'm trying to get to so in the form one if you go to the designer the most interesting part you will see in the designer okay if you come down to the uh, initialize okay so look at this piece of code this is going to be interesting so what happened here is nothing but delegation if you see I had a button one and it has an event called a click and this is an event of button one and what I'm doing is button one underscore click so this is this is a VB uh, oh sorry this this is how the uh, this particular method is uh, associated to this click event by using the plus is equal to operator and this is a uh, uh, since this is a built-in event uh, it's created instance of an event handler okay so this is a typical uh, usage of a delegate okay so when I'm in this so I can have any number of handlers to this event can I yes I can so uh, in this case Okay, I'll, okay, let me do something. I'll say, I'll say message box and uh, just to track that this method, uh, this event handler got executed. My pad, let's actually show and uh, let me add another event handler uh, matching the same. Uh, Thing, and I make it as a button 2 okay and uh, sorry I build it it is good and now let me run and see oops sorry I have to change my startup project set a startup project okay so I just hit this button and say button 1 click but only one of the event handler got fired so if you want to make the other one also fired I need to modify this line okay associate the second also to the same event so button 1 and button 2 you see so that's the typical behavior of a delegate in this case I actually had another event uh, handler and associated that to the button click event so this is uh, since there is a tight relationship between the delegates and uh, events uh, I just started with the delegates um, so if I go back to the uh, uh, menu so this icon if you see so this is an icon that represents the events and um, and it has an event in this case if you see it is associated to two event handlers so this is a click is an event and the event has an event handlers okay so what if I have my class if you remember my uh, earlier examples I have my own class called a car okay typical example we picked and uh, I want to have some events added up to my uh, car class we have seen a behavior for example the start is a behavior stop is a behavior uh, and I added a method called a start with single param double param and so on um, so which can be invoked uh, which are pretty much an instance methods which can be invoked uh, creating instance of my car so what if I want to uh, see when this start got uh, kicked off okay so so let's see how we can do that Oops. Um, okay. In this case, so what are the things we need to do? So it has more steps than a delegate. So delegate is a simple start. So in this case, I need to have a delegate to be first step. 
So to create an event and handle an event within your class, the first thing you need to identify is a delegate. So remember, uh, the text goes like this. It's create or identify. Okay, in our example, so I want to handle a de uh, start delegate. So in this case, I'm actually creating a delegate. So in other cases where uh, when you identify a delegate, so for example, if it is coming from a framework uh, or a third party uh, class, uh, it is uh, have going to have a delegate built in to handle it. Like in the, in the in this case of um, uh, in this case of our example, wherein uh, we have actually uh, seen the system dot event handler. Okay, so this is uh, a built-in delegate, so which we are not going to create, right? So in this case, we just have to identify which delegate we're going to use. Okay, so in this case, it is system dot event handler. Similarly, if your third party has uh, um, given you a library and you need to create that delegate and pass it on to handle stuff then you need to identify that delegate and that's why it is create or identify a delegate okay then step two so in our example we are actually creating a delegate which is pretty much the same example we had uh, just now for delegates which is start delegate taking one uh, string as a parameter and step two is uh, define an event uh, in a class from the delegate. So you want to uh, create an event uh, which is marking the modifier event and it is public event and start delegate is the delegate that we are already created and this event is started. So event name is started uh, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, created out of the start delegate. So that means this event can, hand, can handle uh, any methods matching the start delegate handler. So, so this is the event that I can associate to any number of event handlers matching the uh, signature of a start delegate. So remember, delegate is uh, one that is going to handle or fire uh, the methods that are associated to it. And event is the one that represents that this is a particular. In, uh, so when I'm going to raise the event, that's going to specify uh, when this is going to be fired. So we'll see in step uh, four. So now step three here is the define a method that will raise the event. Um, so this is the method within your uh, within your class uh, where it will raise the event. Okay. In this case, uh, since we have the start method. Um, as part of our class. So I want to, to see when the start got uh, invoked and whenever this uh, the start got invoked I want to handle uh, or I want to notify that this event has occurred. Okay, so in this case uh, my start method is actually raising that event here. It's simply calling the started. Okay, which is the event name here. This is the email event called started and calling the started passing the um, um, parameters. So in this case, uh, since the delegate takes only one parameter, which is of type string, it is actually taking the instance name, which is a single parameter, which is coming in as a start. So uh, in other case, if you see the uh, this example, in this case, uh, uh, what is this uh, button uh, underscore click is taking? If you go back to this source code, so it actually takes two standard uh, parameters in this case. Okay, one is a, a sender as an object, another one is a e as a event args. So this is a standard signature for a built-in events in um, .NET programs. Uh, so okay, we are want to go back to this slide. Okay, so so this is a method within my class which is going to raise that event. Okay. And the fourth one is goes back to the consumer, okay, whoever uh, is actually creating instance of that class and want to handle this event. Uh, and for them, they need to actually define the methods the same way which we did for delegates. So we can define n number of methods which can be uh, associated to that event, which we did like a button click event, okay. So in this case, uh, uh, we just had a handler in this case called uh, my start event handler uh, 
uh, which is meaningful here. So this is going to be my start and event handler, which is taking one parameter. Okay, and the last one is um, uh, going to associate the number of, um, so when we have a method that are going to handle the event and associate them to the uh, started event. So which we have just uh, did the same thing in our uh, code. So we just had, these are the event handlers which I am actually associated to the associated to the click event. Okay. So we'll go back to our code and do that which is with the delegates, right? Yep. Let me take this code away. I meant to say comment it away. Okay the whole thing uh, okay and now I'm going to take my events okay so remember uh, you even when, when you get the source code um, you do the same thing take the whole part away because the reason why because uh, I'm using the same uh, uh, start delegate in that that code also so it will conflict okay so here we are so I will walk through the code again so in this case uh, the first part first step is to declare a delegate in this case a start delegate is declared and uh, and we are in two I just created another class called bus okay so bus is actually inheriting automobile so you just don't want to create a whole set of properties and methods again so I just created a bus class which is inheriting from automobile so that I can inherit all the automobile uh, members since I have it I'm just using the same constant uh, which is not a significance for us at this stage and now the event so this is so I'm going to, going to have event for my bus class which is start delegate which is of uh, uh, which is created out of the start delegate and the event name is started okay and in this case uh, within the my bus class I'm defining when this event should occur so this is where should occur so whenever someone call the bus dot start so immediately the event should uh, occur saying it started Okay, and uh, as usual, the standard line of code goes like console at right line. So whenever bus dot start is called, um, uh, it's going to raise that event that saying it started and do its normal job. So that's the definition of. Um, so this we don't need. Um, so to keep it simple, so that's the uh, definition of my bus class. Okay. So, and within my program, so I'm making use of the bus, right? So within this program, I'm actually declared a event handler with the same signature, wherein it, it returns a void and takes a parameter. So that's the signature of the event handler. Okay, so the event handler name is my start event handler. This can be a pretty uh, much the same as a delegate wherein it can be an instance method it can be a um, it can be a static method in this case it's a static uh, method and it's private again uh, so that's also fine because it's going to be associated with this address and nothing to do with its modifiers okay and within my main method I'm actually creating the instance of the bus class and calling the uh, and associating the event handler to the started event okay uh, if you see the intellisense um, dot the icon for star okay so the, if you see the icon of the uh, start oh yeah I got it yeah so if you see the icon of the start so this represents this is an event and uh, if this is a method and this is a property so this are, everyone has their own respective icon so this is signifies that this is recognized as an event okay and um, dot sta okay started okay so 
okay and and I just call this start uh, method uh, in which case it should fire the uh, event handler also okay so if I run this oops, again so I need to set the modifiers as the startup project okay so if I see so I invoke the um, the start event handle if you see start event handle where is obj bus dot start uh, which is Yep, so this is the event handler and it, this is what uh, is writing that uh, content out. So we're just uh, calling this start event handled and that's what we see. The first thing uh, happens is the event got handled and the next thing is uh, continuation to the implementation of the bus class. So this is nothing but um, this one. So the first instance is, is actually raised that event and we handle that event with the event handler and immediately followed by the normal operation of the bus wherein it just says uh, bus.start got invoked okay so that should be clear enough and uh, yeah if you want to handle more uh, uh, handlers to it you can do that so I'm in this case I'm going to add another handler Okay, handler say handler two. Okay, and uh, st start even handled for the second time. Okay, and in this case, I'm going to associate it, associate that even handler to this using the same syntax, uh, but passing the two. Okay. So it is uh, my uh, so since this uh, the name of this method is passed uh, is part of the same class so that's why I'm just passing that name uh, okay so in other words uh, if you have an instance method instance method that you want to pass on uh, you can do that uh, in that case you will refer to the object dot instance method okay. And I'm going to run this, so I should see both the event handlers got fired uh, that handles the start event. Okay, so in this case, the first event and the second one also fired and continued with the operation. Uh, so this is a very, very useful uh, feature uh, and again, a very, very important topic in um, of uh, .NET uh, and uh, people do ask uh, what is a delegate and how do you declare sometimes um, uh, some extreme uh, interviewers will even ask uh, to uh, tell you the steps how will you uh, uh, create a delegate and use it and some people if you go to a face-to-face -face interview then they might even ask you to uh, write this piece of code uh, on a paper uh, so a wide variety of things people do ask uh, so, so this is a very, very important uh, topic to uh, so uh, get this code downloaded and uh, walk through the steps and uh, try to do your own uh, uh, homework. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, I did the handle. I created an event called started. You can actually do with the honk because honk is also part of the uh, automobile class in this case and also add your own uh, events so whatever you think is feasible uh, whatever you think can make sense or you know uh, then uh, play around with this and this is going to be a very very important topic uh, if you understand it better it's going to be a very uh, a smooth topic it's not complicated as it looks okay so we'll continue so we are good with the events and this is the code that we just uh, demonstrated and um, the next topic is extern so if you have any doubts with the delegate and events just uh, drop down a line um, uh, hope you, uh, if you don't want to forget it and pay attention to each of the topic okay don't keep your mind um, um, to the respect of old topic if you have any questions so if you have any question drop it drop a line uh, with a question and then um, concentrate on the current topic okay so the next modifier is extern as the keyword itself indicates that it's external okay 
Um, so this indicates that the method is implemented externally. So use the external modifier in the method declaration to indicate that the method is implemented externally. The, a, a common use of the external modifier is with the DLL import. Okay, so this is a very interesting uh, uh, aspect. Um, abstract and external modifiers cannot be used together to modify the same member. If you remember abstract members, whenever you declare uh, someone who uh, inherit and inherit them, they need to implement them. Okay, so extern is not like that. So extern, whenever you uh, notify uh, or decorate a member uh, saying uh, it's extern, so it's actually implemented by someone else. So it can be from a, another DLL. Uh, that DLL might be a DLL which is uh, not uh, a user-created DLL. It could be a system DLL. Okay. So in this case, if you see, uh, uh, using a DLL import is a new statement that we are introducing here. So using a DLL import, we can actually import any uh, system-related DLLs or any third-party DLLs uh, into your program. Uh, this is again uh, without adding a reference to the DLL. Okay, keep in mind we are not actually adding a reference to the DLL as an add reference, right? In this case, we are just importing this uh, DLL at runtime, uh, and the way we decorate this is called an attributes. So these are a method attributes. Uh, there are so many attributes that you can decorate. So these attributes will give you an additional features added up to your uh, members. Okay, like uh, serializable is one, and in this case we're using a DLL import, and there are so many. When we um, uh, probably I will show you wherever possible. Um, so the, probably in advanced programming we will use more of these when you do a WCF programming, wherein um, the the contracts have uh, the attributes that will specify uh, how to do it. And also uh, in web-based uh, uh, validations, uh, you can create these attributes implementations uh, uh, by yourself and decorate the members with your own custom attributes so that you extend the uh, your members' uh, features um, uh, to using code. Okay, so. So in this case, we are simply using the DLL import as uh, one of the attribute available uh, and uh, import the DLL. Uh, we are referring to the DLL name and uh, specifying this method uh, saying that it is an external. So that means the implementation of this message box is uh, implemented in this DLL. So when the compiler runs this program, it's going to make use of this external keyword and the DLL to see, uh, to check the implementation of the message box. Okay. Uh, so if you remember normally in message box dot show we used in the Windows based applications wherein uh, it needs to have the certain uh, uh, implicit. So in this case we are actually directly using the user 32 DLL. So uh, okay. So the demo. Okay, in this case, I'm going to uncomment this. Okay, so this is a pretty straightforward uh, example, um, and the most importantly, the namespace that is imported here. If you see the runtime dot uh, interrupt services, so this interrupt services will I, uh, will have the DLL import uh, as a, a modifier. What will happen if I don't include this? We'll see. So if you see, so DLL import cannot be found. If you want to use the DLL import, then you need to make use of this. Okay, you will see different different uh, um, namespaces. If you see, for example, in this case, I am talking about uh, system dot runtime dot interrupt services, and you might immediately think, how will I know that there is something like this that exists? And uh, when I write a program. How will I know that I I need to use this or that and so on, right? So that's a very common uh, thing. So uh, common thing that might come into your come into your brain. So the simple answer I would give you is um, 
um, no one will know everything, okay? So the libraries, there are thousands of uh, namespaces available around it. And the first release itself, there were around 6,000 uh, namespaces available. And today, it probably crossed around uh, 20,000 or 30,000. I don't know the number. But the point here is that uh, that's a vast number of uh, uh, namespaces, uh, classes available there to use, okay? And uh, one need not worry about which one, uh, you worry about everything, right? So even in a given context, uh, what program you're writing? So whenever you start uh, thinking, right? So, okay, I want to write a program uh, that is going to be a Windows based program. Okay, so you will create the pro um, project and according to that. Okay, today I'm going to make a program um, which can send an email out. Okay, uh, how to send an email out? So go to MSDN. Okay, so MSDN is the best place where you can uh, search for. So look at this way. So the community other than MSDN is a community which will give you a code snippets uh, examples that can work for you instantaneously. Um, uh, for example, the best one I refer is the code project or C Sharp Corner or so on. So there are a wide variety of good uh, places where people do post articles um, showing an example code and they will show you how this code is working and so on. So uh, whereas MSDN is completely like a reference point. I'll open it. Um, so this is going to be a good uh, good thing that uh, you need to know because I might tell you that uh, this is how we're going to use it. That's the reason my focus in the training is uh, not to show you all the libraries. It's to show you the way how to write the code and also ability to understand if you have an error, how to understand that error. So that if you want to understand that error, you need to know the basics behind that error. Okay, so the, my focus on the training is to give you that uh, uh, footboard okay so that use this information and uh, uh, excel your uh, type of applications that you're going to write down the line okay so in this case uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do uh, I'm always refer to the MSDN so I'll simply go to Google which is a favorite friend and in this case I want to I want to do do a uh, say email okay uh, so sending email Okay, uh, using C, using C sharp, so I can say MSDN or MSDN, okay? Or you will see as plenty of um, user specific in this case, how do I send email using C sharp? So you can straight away land up to a site where uh, you have um, the code snippets available readily. Um, and also, uh, in other words, um, uh, if you know which assembly or which namespace has it, then you can straight away go to the uh, MSDN. For example, in this case, I'll open this link. I'll say right click and open a new tab. Okay, so people have posted or somebody had asked a question and you have plenty of answers and if you see this is readily code available, just copy and test it for yourself. Okay, and interestingly, the whenever you see this code, you will see a, a, a namespace that has been referred. So in this case, okay, system.web.mail.mail message is what used for sending mail. Okay, so now I want to know what all available, what else is available within this. So this uh, post might not give you that information. Okay, for that information, you will go to MSDN. So what I'll do is I'll copy that uh, namespace mail and I say MSDN. Okay. So MSDN stands for Microsoft uh, Developers Network, which is a MSDN publishing. This is uh, you can use as a reference. Okay. So when I uh, open this, so this will have the complete information of that namespace so uh, so it's a class library it's actually giving you a library uh, and it has all these classes okay SMTP mail mail message and also description when will you use what 
and also if you get into the respect to mail attachment in this case mail attachment uh, it has it will give you good in, good amount of information that's why it's called as a as a reference so as a reference you will know what all implications are are applicable to this and if you say a uh, mail members or what all methods it has uh, this is public properties and if you have a constructor so whenever you refer this if you, you should know what is a constructor you should know what is a property you should know what is a method and so on so at least to make use of this reference so once you have this uh, this will give you pretty much information of what to do how to do okay and what all are available and what they can be used for okay and also, uh, MSDN also good in giving examples also. It's not that just a reference. Uh, for example, uh, uh, mail message, if I go there, and uh, if you see down the line, it has given the example also. And in Visual Basic, uh, this is an example, it will give you even cross languages as well. So it's pretty much, you know, it, it has a complete example. It will ask you to just uh, uh, copy this code and paste it in a new application and then run it, it will run. So it's going to be as good as that and you can walk through. This is pretty much a form designer and a C-sharp code behind and so on. Um, uh, in the worst case, the worst case can happen, I know there are uh, clients places uh, where you might not have access to an internet. Okay, so that will be a very tough case. Uh, in that case, what you need to do is, you, uh, in most of the uh, uh, such environments, uh, you will have the MSDN installed in your machine. So MSDN is not only available on the internet, it also comes as an install that can be installed within your uh, uh, client machine. And uh, for uh, for hundred percent for sure if people restrict your access to the internet they will at least provide you the MSDN library on your desktop in which case you can that's pretty much integrated with your Visual Studio uh, so Visual Studio if you go and help uh, uh, you will have the MSDN link in this case if you see the MSDN forums uh, and so on so you can actually make use of that and if the MSDN is installed it will be part of your uh, uh, in your console but since I haven't installed it uh, you will not see it here otherwise you will see an MSDN uh, link here that will open the MSDN in your local okay so MSDN is your best uh, uh, helper in your real-time uh, code writing so once you know the, all these keywords and what they stand for and how to use what um, you can make use of it okay so we'll come back to the um, extern keyword okay um, so you're clear with that and then the uh, DLL import uh, in this case I'm actually uh, making use of the message box within the DLL import, which is user32.dll. And what I'm doing here is, uh, it's pretty string. What I'm taking is, I'm taking a user input. Uh, in this case, if you see, uh, we have seen so far just console.write line. In this case, we are actually reading the value from the command prompt by using console.read line. The demo here, what I'm trying to do here is I'm going to uh, ask the user to input the name and, I'm, uh, and read that uh, whatever I input, which is used by using the console.read line and taking that into a string and I'm actually going to call the message box, which is this. And of course, the signature of this message box and the name should of course match to the uh, member within your DLL. Okay, so how will you know that? Uh, that will be part of your, uh, again, DLL, your respective DLL's documentation. So whoever gives you the DLL documentation, uh, they will give you what are the parameters it's going to take and, uh, okay, and uh, you need not worry about that as well at this stage. And uh, so that ma that should match the signature because whenever uh, the compiler is going to invoke the respective member in the DLL, it need to pass the same set of uh, members so that it matches uh, with the runtime. And in this case, uh, I'm just passing the uh, hello and the this is the title of the message box and the string I'm concatenating with the name that I entered, saying hello. Okay, so if I run this, let's see what happens. So this is where it's holding uh, 
So I'm going to give my name. Okay, and just say enter. So what happened is my message box, if you see this is a Windows dialog uh, that I can able to bring up in a console application. So if you see, so I will to uh, get this message box which is a Windows based uh, from a console application. Usually you don't have that, right? So I will to do that by using the uh, external DLL import and do it. Okay, so that's the uh, overview of extern. Hope you're clear with this, pretty straightforward. And the override, we have already seen the override and needless to again stress on that. Uh, just to give you a recap, uh, you can use the apps, uh, you can use the override uh, to specify uh, uh, that you want to override the base class implementations when you derive it. So in this case, we have uh, um, the uh, auto mobile as a base class, and it has uh, two things. One is uh, the abstract member, which is only the def uh, signature but no definition. So when I'm um, when I'm declaring the or, or implementing the abstract members at that time, I use the override keyword, uh, which will say implementing the abstract property. This is an implement abstract property. And similarly, when I do, uh, uh, when I have a base class um, uh, method um, that I want to override, it's in the derived class. At that time, I need to specify it as a virtual. And on the right hand side, I still use the override keyword as a modifier. The override modifier indicates that I am actually overriding the base class implementations. Either using, uh, either you're overriding a abstract member, in which case you call it as a implementing the abstract member. Uh, in other case, uh, whereas overriding the base class uh, uh, method with the same signature, uh, which is part of the polymorphous implementation, right? So you can do the override keyword uh, using that uh, and the read only so read only keyword or uh, or the modifier so read only modifier is a little different from the read only properties so it's pretty much same of course behavior wise so when we uh, you use the read only keyword uh, again so if you remember the vb.net code when we had a read only property at that time we used the read only keyword for when we use in vb.net uh, which is different in csharp.net. When we have a property uh, specified as a read-only, all we need is to take away the setter. All we need is keep only getter. If you have only getter, that means it becomes a uh, read-only property. Uh, whereas in vb.net, you have to specify it explicitly saying read-only and specify only getter implementation, right? So people do normally ask you the difference. So what is uh, read-only in csharp? Okay, so read-only in vb.net is different from read-only in csharp.net. So this is specific to csharp.net. So read-only um, is a modifier uh, that you can specify to the fields. Uh, the fields are, in this case, uh, you have a public field which is marked as a read-only. And uh, you initialize that this is behavior is same as uh, any read-only property. So when we do a, a fields, they don't, they're not, uh, properties they are directly accessible by anyone so it's pretty much in other words equal to a, a constants as well so we can declare a constant which cannot be modified uh, but the difference between a constant and uh, a read-only field is that the uh, the, the read-only fields uh, can be initialized inside a, a constructor okay whereas a constants uh, can be initialized only when they are declared uh, they cannot be modified anywhere else in the program. So whereas the read-only, if you see in this case, uh, okay, so we mark these two fields as read-only. In the first case, we assign this value to 50. And the second case, we have not an initialized it. So initialization is done in the constructor. Okay, so in this case, uh, the read-only member is initialized with 24. And then we are making use of it, and also you can have you can initialize them in the parameterized constructor. So this is a default constructor wherein the read-only fields got initialized, and this is a parameterized constructor wherein the read-only fields got initialized with the parameters. 
Okay, so that's the difference between a constant and a read-only field, where the constant can be initialized only at their declaration, not uh, anywhere else in the program. And while using the program, uh, we did make use of the uh, constructor. We passed in three values, uh, and we just write the value out. And uh, also default constructor, we made use of it, and only x. Uh, P to dot x, uh, x is not a uh, read-only member. It's a, we see x is a public field. It's not a read-only. So x can be modified. This is okay. Okay, whereas uh, if you try to uh, set the uh, read-only attribute, it's a compile time error. Okay, we'll see that quickly. It's going to be short. read-only demo. Okay, I'm going to take, command this code. Okay, compile this to see there are no errors. Good. So in this case, we have the int as a public uh, int. This is a read-write field. Anyone can access it. And uh, here these two are read-only. And the read-only Z, Z is in a slide initialized in the constructor, in the default constructor 24. And also you can initialize the uh, read-only members uh, Y and Z in the parameterized constructors and making use of them here. So in the first case we use the parameterized constructor to initialize the um, three fields inside the uh, uh, inside this class p1 oh sorry inside the class and then within the instance of p1 and also p2 uh, is using default constructor wherein uh, we are initializing the value explicitly in this case I can only access x which is a public uh, field whereas if I try to access y it's a compile time error because it's read only field. Okay, so it says a read-only field cannot be assigned to. Pretty simple. Um, so again if you run this code of course we normally expect to see the values uh, that are assigned uh, whereas in the first case it is 70, 60 and 80 when we use the default uh, parameters constructor. In other case the default value is showed up uh, whereas y got initialized uh, So whereas y got initialized 55, uh, sorry 50, and uh, z got initialized in the default constructor 24. Okay, that's the difference between p1 and p2. Hope that is clear, pretty straightforward. Okay, so read only is good. And sealed, sealed is again an interesting aspect and I hope I have covered it previously, um, but we'll cover it again quickly. So when you mark a class or a member as sealed, you can also apply the sealed method, a sealed modifier to a, uh, a method also. So when you mark it to sealed, uh, what it indicates that uh, they are done for uh, inheritance. So no one can inherit these sealed members. Okay, so this is how you can restrict uh, in people inheriting from your class or inheriting or overriding a sealed method. Okay, so we'll see a quick example also. This is again a simple straightforward one. Okay, let me comment this out prior doing it. Hmm. Just scroll it quick. Okay, so in this case, uh, I just have plain my base class uh, with property and a method, and this is a virtual method so that I can override in my base class. Uh, this is another example to for override again. So override, you have I have a derived class which is inheriting from my base class here, and I'm overriding the my method. Okay, so this is my method. I'm overriding it. Um, so the distinction here is when I, when I invoke my method, uh, base class member, so it's going to say my base class something and the other one it says override something. Um, so that's the override flavor of my base class. 
Okay, and I hit run and I see the flavor of my base class. Uh, so when I created uh, the derived class DC uh, DC dot by method, so it's actually gave you the derived members flavor, right? Which is my derived class, my base class override something. So we got uh, successfully overridden the base class member. Good. And another interesting thing I want to show you if possible. Okay, so when I created uh, this, is this possible? Okay, if you see, so the left hand side is uh, my base class and I'm actually creating DC of type my base class but creating instance of a derived class. Okay, so what will happen? So even then I see a derived class behavior. Okay, because although the DC is a variable of type my base class, when I instantiated it, I did it for derived class. Okay, uh, it is possible because they all are under the same inheritance hierarchy. Okay, mutually they can be created because the, they all share the same base class. You can do this. And also what you can do is you can typecast it. So in this case what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to typecast uh, DC to my base class. Okay. I'll say my base class DC and I assign this to my base class. Okay. Uh, base class is equal to Okay, so what I'm trying to do here is, uh, uh, let me compile, it still stands good. So what I'm going to do is uh, invoke the base class. Okay, bc dot my method. So if you see carefully, notice the difference. There's only one new here. The first instance is a dc, which is a derived class and I'm actually creating another uh, variable of base class um, from my base class and I'm actually typecasting derived class to base class. So this is the typecast operation uh, wherein I give the type uh, within brackets before the variable and what happens is the DC which is of type my derived class is typecasted to my base class. And if I invoke uh, base class dot my method, then which one will be invoked? That's it. Both have the same derived class members. Okay. So you can do a type casting between a higher level to lower level uh, members using uh, type casting this one. Uh, okay, so if you have any doubts on typecasting, let me know. We can do another, uh, I can cover that in another session also. Okay, so in this case, what we're trying to do is the uh, demonstration of, uh, so let me take, uh, take the code away. Okay, yep. In this case, what I'm trying to do is sealed, right? So in this case, this is doable only because uh, the class um, is just a class my base even if I seal it if I'm if I seal this class then you cannot derive it okay so what it says the modifier my derived class cannot derive derive from sealed type base class so it is clear so you can apply this sealed class at the class level in this case. I compile this, it is good. And also seal it here. So you can apply seal only along with the override. Okay, the base class uh, is virtual. So this is a second level of inheritance. And then I can do this. So wherein I can mark the uh, derived class as seal. So what this indicates is that if I have any other uh, level of inheritance, right? Uh, when I create another 
base derived class. I'll say derived derived class. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so this is a derived class uh, derived from derived class. Okay, so I'm trying to override the my method. What will happen? So it doesn't allow because the base class member is is uh, sealed. Okay, so what it says? So the derived derived class my method cannot override inherited member uh, because it is sealed. Okay, so that's all about sealed. So you can restrict uh, people overriding um, Okay, no problem. I'll do that later. I just wanted to document that um, for uh, later use. So we are good with the seal. I hope uh, no questions. That's again pretty straightforward, simple. You use the seal modifier to uh, restrict uh, the overriding of the um, your members. So you can apply it at the class level or at the member level. Okay. So that's about. Uh, seal okay okay good okay uh, is there anything that we missed here oh yes yeah. so another important thing here is structures are implicitly sealed if you see uh, structures cannot be uh, inherited so if you remember the, we cannot do inheritance using structures uh, and because they are implicitly sealed and Okay, so what else next? Static. Static is another uh, keyword that we have gone through several times, and uh, that's again an ax. Uh, that's again a modifier, uh, which will make the member uh, specific to the class rather than to the instance. Okay, so in this case, uh, I can uh, use that static uh, uh, to uh, literally anywhere actually. So with the class modifier, uh, I think starting from. Uh, uh, .NET language uh, framework 2.0 onwards um, uh, framework supports having uh, classes being static you can also have a static classes uh, wherein you can have a static constructors we have seen that when we were dealing with these uh, constructors uh, type of constructors wherein you can have a constructor static uh, in this case I have a um, pretty much example of uh, having a static uh, fields and this is a static constructor and this is a, a static read and write property and this is a static uh, read only property and so on I have a pretty bunch of things that I can make use of static and the important thing that you need to remember is a static members are not specific to the instance they are specific to the class so that's the reason whenever you make a call to the static members you will make a call using their class name not their instance name okay so if you see the uh, the right hand side uh, in this case uh, uh, also uh, we're actually this this demo is actually trying to show you uh, a very interesting thing I, I hope we did this uh, previous time as well um, so what this uh, demo is trying to do, trying to do is to show uh, how many instance of the class is uh, created how many instances are created uh, and also how what was the first timestamp when the first instance was created okay so since the static members are specific to the class that means only one copy of these very uh, of these uh, will be shared across n number of instances so it is possible to track how many instances of this particular object has been created and also when it is created because static members will be um, uh, will be called only the, for the first time and the remaining time it will not be called so uh, I'm, uh, I made use of that behavior to track the timestamp when the uh, when the first uh, instance is created so the static constructor will be uh, invoked when the first instance got created so for the remaining subsequent instances, uh, the static member method will not be uh, invoked. Okay, that's the behavior of a static constructor. So it is used to 
initialize the static uh, private members. Okay, so here I have a static data uh, date time timestamp for first time. I'm using the uh, static constructor to initialize it. So remember one thing when we talk about statics, um, uh, instance members uh, like the case here. Okay, so this is an instance member. If you see, there is no static keyword associated to it. So that means this show is uh, associated to the instance, which is P1 here. So that's the instance of the uh, person static within which you have show method. And it can be accessed using the instance. That's why it is instance members. Whereas the static members are associated to the uh, class itself, which is person static. Okay, that's the key difference. So whenever you're doing this, um, you need to keep one thing in mind. Um, that is uh, the instance methods can access the static members like this way. Whereas static members cannot access the instance members. Remember, so in this case, um, if you see, this is a static property and it is actually accessing a local private member, member which is a number of instances and the number of instances is again a static and this needs to be static. If this is not a static member, then you cannot access that inside a static mem method. Okay, that's the key thing that you need to remember. But why? If you ask why, uh, as you remember, statics are uh, specific to the class. So when the class is initialized for the first time, all the static members will be uh, loaded for the first time before any instance is created. Okay, and the first instance copy is shared across the instances. So it is not associated to the instance, but it is associated to the class. So that's why uh, instance members ex uh, come into picture after the static members got created. So that's why static members cannot access instance members. Okay, makes sense. Uh, whereas instance members can access the static members because by the time the static members are available, uh, uh, by the, oh, sorry, by the time the instance members are available, static members are already created in the memory. Okay, that's a straight uh, forward. So to remember or uh, don't get confused, static comes first and the instance comes next. So that's why uh, static cannot access instance because instance doesn't exist when they are available. Okay, so in this case, uh, I'm trying to track the timestamp when this has got created and I made, uh, okay, let me go through the code. Okay. okay, this is taken care of. Okay, I have a person static here and I have a number of instances and a static uh, field as a date stamp when the first instance got created. And in the constructor, uh, I'm using a static constructor here, which is a static and a constructor name, matching the name of the class. Uh, initializing with the uh, now, so that means it is going to take the timestamp when the first time this got invoked. That means this will get invoked only when the first instance got created. And uh, subsequent instances, uh, you will get the instance constructor will be invoked. So when the first one is invoked, so in the instance constructor, what I'm doing is I am incrementing the number of instances. Okay, so to track how many instances uh, is getting created. So that's the uh, definition of a constructor here. So I'm tracking two things, number of instances and uh, the timestamp of the first instance. And I have two properties again, uh, number of instances. Uh, this is a read and write static property. And I have another one, which is a read only static property, which is going to give me this timestamp. Because this particular timestamp, I don't want anyone else to modify uh, because this is going to keep the copy when the first instance got created and it's not going to be updated anywhere else because this is only read only. And in this case, whenever I say show, it's going to show me the instance, uh, number of instances that got created and the timestamp uh, when the first instance got created. Uh, since uh, the program is going to run pretty fast, what I did interestingly here is to delay the creation of instances. Okay, how can I delay a program execution? 
So this is a little uh, introduction to the threading concepts. So in this case I created the first instance uh, P0 and I assigned uh, a unique ID 100 uh, name myself and uh, and uh, writing showing that uh, I'm using a default parameterless constructor because I'm not passing any parameters. So in this case um, what should happen here is the first static constructor should get fired and uh, the timestamp should be saved and also the number of instances got create, incremented and immediately what I'm trying to do is uh, since the timestamp uh, I want to make some difference in the timestamp because otherwise you will not notice a big difference I am actually delaying uh, the program here so I'm save the thread dot sleep for 1000 milliseconds so 1000 milliseconds is pretty much equal to one second uh, it's not pretty much it's actually equal to one second so I'm delaying uh, the program execution for one second here by using thread dot sleep okay and uh, I'm creating the next instance uh, this is just to keep a difference between the first instance uh, time at which first instance got created and the time at which the second instance got created okay so that we'll see uh, oh, the clearly we'll see the the first instance when it's created is retained uh, in the second instance also so if I run this program see there is a slight delay between the first and second which is uh, almost a se uh, one second uh, if you see the the creation of two instances and in the first case we see the number of instances is one and again in the number of instances the second case is two but uh, if you see the timestamp uh, uh, when the first instance got created it is it has actually retained the timestamp at the first instance got created and number of instances is getting incremented because uh, the number of instances and the uh, the uh, the time it when it's created both are static and those two are shared across n number of instances in this case uh, both two different instances uh, wherein the unique ID is 100 here and unique ID is 200 here and uh, the name is uh, Gopi here and uh, the name here is Shekhar okay so that's uh, kind of a uh, uh, usage you can use uh, using the sta static members. Hope that is clear and static is a very very interesting and important topic again needless to say everything is important. Um, uh, so the reason is uh, whenever you make use of static because of their shared nature they can create uh, a catastrophic results uh, if you are not code them properly you because uh, the respective members are shared across uh, multiple instances if one instance is trying to modify the other one um, you will not have control over uh, the values that have been changed and that's when uh, it creates the more uh, uh, not thread safe there is something called thread safety so in this case we're actually using uh, just a small intro of thread uh, here so static members are not thread safe because uh, when multiple threads are trying to access the same members uh, there's some something called a critical uh, section wherein the updates made by one thread can overlap the updates made by other thread so if you have a static member which is shared member in vb.net uh, can be shared across multiple instance multiple threads so uh, by multiple instances so if a number of ins instance 1 in thread 1 uh, and instance 2 in thread 2 both are trying to access the same shared memory so you can imagine what can happen so either the updates done by one thread will overlap the other thread or both trying to reach, re read the same thing at the same time uh, that can also create a deadlock situations and so on so uh, static members are very uh, useful at the same time they're very are catastrophic if they're not used properly okay and that's all about the static members um, and uh, unsafe uh, unsafe is a modifier that you can use to specify that your context uh, is unsafe and which is using some kind of a unsafe code in general whenever using a pointers uh, the compiler uh, is going to crib that this is unsafe code so still if you want to uh, use it pointers uh, forcefully 
you need to specify the unsafe context and also when you compile them you need to compile them using the uh, unsafe switch when you compile. So since we are using from IDE, in IDE you need to specify that um, uh, allow unsafe code then only this uh, unsafe code can be compiled. Um, so in this case, in, in this example, we are actually trying to deal with the value types to behave like a reference types and that is possible using pointers. If you see value types, uh, when you create a variable uh, in C sharp, um, a value type will save the value along with the variable, whereas a reference type will save the reference of the value where it is stored. So that means the uh, reference types can be mutable, whereas the value types are immutable, right? So we did talk about that uh, elaborately in the previous session. So, um, so for now, so what what I'm trying to do here is using pointers. I'm trying to make a value type uh, mutable. So that means uh, in this case, we see int. Okay, so int i is a value type. So what I'm trying to do is I'm passing the address of uh, int using address operator uh, which is possible uh, in C sharp only. This is not supported in VB.NET. So this is a kind of, uh, whenever you use address of int i and pointer p this is using pointer. So in this case uh, it is a completely unsafe code. Why? Because the I'm trying to pass the address of i as a parameter to another method. Another method is again, uh, this method is trying to take a pointer, that means a reference to an address. And we are actually updating, multiplying the address with the value at this given pointer. That means it is pretty much is equal to, if you pass uh, 10, then 10 uh, multiplied by 10. So that's what it means. So this is a uh, multiplication assignment operator and this is a pointer that is using it. So when I pass the address of i, so what happens at the next statement is I'm actually reading the i. See this is, this operation if you see it is not a straightforward uh, operation. This is actually written in wide in general. If I don't do unsafe code, what I would do is I would make this written type as int and I use the written uh, p into p or uh, whatever. I will not have the pointer here. I will have a simple int p and p into p I am just going to return it and that written I am going to catch it catch it uh, in a local variable and print it out. So in this case what I'm doing is I'm creating a local variable int i passing its address and when I pass the address to this method it's actually modifying that address here. So when it's star p that means the pointer that is address of i and it's actually uh, manipulating that address directly and reading that address out. So in this case I am actually making my value type uh, behave like a reference type. Okay, so this is what uh, we see. Okay, so the unsafe code, yep. Um, so this is uh, 10 into 10, I see 100. So this is an unsafe code. To make this code work, what you need to do is you need to compile the code with the slash unsafe switch or in IDE, what you need to do is you need to uh, go to build and check this option which is uh, allow unsafe code. Otherwise, this cannot be compiled. If so, so if I uh, uncheck that and build, so it's not going to compile, it's going to crib saying unsafe code may not appear with the compi uh, 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 compiling with an un unsafe switch. So it's pretty much passing the switch here. 
Okay, so that's about turn safe and I think the last one, uh, virtual, we have already seen you have to decorate the um, uh, base class members using virtual key, virtual modifier to make them overridden in, your, in their base classes. Uh, the same example is there, you can actually download and see which we have seen several times. And volatile is the last one, last modifier. Volatile is a pretty interesting, what it means is whenever you make volatile, uh, this is going to be thread safe. So if you remember the fields and the static members when I was saying it was not a thread safe. So uh, when when you decorate uh, your members using volatile, uh, these members, all of their fields directly accessible are thread safe. Uh, what, what this means is the compiler is going to ensure that um, these members are accessed uh, uh, one at a time in a serialized or order. So no multiple threads can access it at the same time, but they can be access uh, the volatile members uh, in a serialized way. Uh, so this will be more thread safe. Um, so in other words, you can achieve that uh, behavior uh, using locking concept. Uh, you lock the variable uh, before it gets updated by one of the thread so that uh, no other threads uh, overlap um, uh, the updates that have been performed by one thread. So you can use a volatile keyword in, uh, to avoid the locking again. So this will ensure pretty much uh, the same behavior. Okay, so this code uh, is available of course, the volatile is also available uh, on safe uh, you can, uh, it's pretty much simple, it's, there's nothing uh, uh, because we didn't do any um, multi-threaded programming so I did not put any extensive code here, uh, it's uh, pretty much uh, the demo of the keyword itself uh, saying the volatile and trying to uh, initialize it in the parameter as constructor and calling it. So this pretty much does nothing but um, uh, just making use of volatile keyword here. So if you want to really demonstrate the volatile behavior then we need to actually have a multi-threaded uh, code uh, simulate the critical section um, scenario and then make use of volatile and then see. So it's going to be a very a different uh, topic which we will take out of this session. This will take us to the end of the um, modifiers. Uh, session 12, uh, we did see all the topics, uh, very, very good topics of uh, delegates. Uh, how can we declare them? How can we uh, bind uh, methods to a delegates and how we can invoke them, we did see. And uh, this is just to cover the modifier called event. And uh, we did see a very good example of how we can use uh, the delegates in context with events. Uh, and uh, this is the same demo we did see and we did cover what is an event, how can we create or identify a delegate before we go with an event and then define an event in a class uh, and then define a method that will raise the event which is your uh, handler and uh, define methods to handle the event and then associate the methods uh, uh, to the event, uh, how can we reuse this event and uh, how can we use an event in a given program with a very good example. And also we did see, uh, this is a code demo we did see and uh, the extern keyword we did see, uh, override keyword, uh, read only, how can we make a read only keyword, how different it is from a read only properties we did see, uh, read only is applicable for fields and uh, uh, we did see what's a sealed class, uh, how can we use a sealed modifier for a class and what uh, what is it is going to make uh, special about a class if we decorate that with a sealed modifier. And we did see what's a static modifier uh, and how uh, important it is and how uh, uh, um, to create the static members and uh, make use of them and at what all different places we can have a static uh, uh, modifier used, uh, uh, we did see a very good demo as well and we did see a good example of an unsafe code, a virtual keyword, which we, virtual modifier which we have already seen in the other uh, sessions and uh, finally we did see what is a volatile uh, modifier and how it is used. Okay, so with this we'll continue with the next topics in the subsequent session. Mm -hmm.